we now return to the fifth annual Fanny Awards. Hey, howdy, hey, it's me, it's Andrew Fantasia. Welcome back to the fifth annual Fanny Awards, the greatest that cinema had to offer in 2019. Let's kick it up a notch. Bam. I can't believe I'm making that kind of reference. All right. So what was my eighth favorite film of the year? That's where we're at right now. Number eight for me as we cruise higher and higher through this top 10 list. Well, get comfy, kids. I'd like you all to do me a little bit of a favor. And that favor is this. Help me if you can. I'm feeling down. Psych, I can't feel down. It's impossible to feel down because my number eight movie of the year was yesterday. Back in June of 2019, all my troubles seemed so far away. Now I need a place to hide away. Still, just kidding, I don't need a place to hide away. But what I do need is a place where I can quietly go and watch yesterday again. Because folks, yesterday is straight up delightful. Telling the story of a young musician named Jack who wakes up one morning in a world where the Beatles never existed and only he remembers that they ever did. Holy crap, is that ever a recipe for fun? And it ends up being exactly that. It ends up being a recipe for fun because Jack takes it to the, you know, as far limits as you can imagine. He becomes the Beatles in this new parallel world. He kickstarts a music career that actually goes somewhere before he was writing his own songs and they weren't great. Now all of a sudden he's writing Eleanor Rigby and The Long and Winding Road and people can't get enough of him and he is the biggest music superstar on the planet and it just keeps snowballing and the lie gets out of hand and he's like, is it a lie? Because they didn't exist in this world, but I'm taking credit for the work of others, even though that work never technically happened. It is a mind F in the best possible way. God, I love yesterday. And I think that this movie does a really good job of encompassing the same theme all throughout. And bear with me as I try to describe this, but to me at least, the music of the Beatles has always been music that whether or not the subject matter is positive or negative, you know, Eleanor Rigby is a sad song, but regardless, the music of the Beatles fills me with joy. It does. I can't feel bad when I'm listening to the Beatles. It just, it has that effect on me. This movie about the music of the Beatles also fills me with joy. It is a very happy, pleasant, movie up to and including the color scheme for all the logos is yellow the color of joy and happiness it just permeates this whole film never to like a sickly saccharine kind of way where you're like oh god somebody please stick a finger down my throat and and you know show me something else this isn't like some triple g rated care bears adventure this is a really fun interesting character piece about this guy Jack it's a rom-com between Jack and this girl that he's been friends with for many years and it's a musical like it's just it's got all these wonderful elements of just sheer joy packed together into this one little movie and it never stops being joyful throw in a pretty friggin hilarious cameo by Ed Sheeran which is you know what scratch that it's not a cameo Ed Sheeran's like a main character in this movie Ed Sheeran has like as much screen time in this as Stifler did in like American Pie 1. Ed Sheeran is all over this movie and his performance is great. You know, you don't think of Ed Sheeran as an actor, but he does a really good job in this. He's funny and his role is kind of self-effacing, which is again, wonderful. A lot of famous people, especially, you know, not actors would never step into a role like this because their egos get in the way. But Ed Sheeran doesn't let his ego get in the way. He's just like, hey, I'm, I'm Ed Sheeran. And I'm in this movie and I'm going to make fun of myself. And he has a great time. And because of that, we have a great time. Yesterday is a full-on bundle of absolute joy. The show tonight on Trampoline may be for the benefit of Mr. Kite, but trust me, yesterday is for the benefit of everybody. Movie lovers, music lovers, Beatles lovers, 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 because again, it's kind of a romantic comedy. Everybody is going to walk away happy as hell. And that seems to be the main thesis of yesterday is just be happy as hell. There's so much worth being happy about. I love you yesterday. You rocked. You know what? It goes to show, yesterday's such a great movie and it's only number eight, man. That's how good this year's list ended up being. But you know, some people, some people don't like happiness and music and love and art. Some people, Master Bruce, just want to watch the world burn.
Wow. Usually I'm pretty proud of my Cockney Michael Caine accent, but that was horrible. I apologize to Michael Caines everywhere. But I want to talk about those people, those people who don't like art and music and the Beatles and happiness, those people who just want to watch the world burn. I want to talk about villains because it's time to give out the award for best villain who was bad to the bone in 2019 in the most interesting way. Well, this year we had sort of a running theme where we had a lot of evil or sinister families. And it just ended up being that way where the nominees include not one, not two, but three sinister families. Throw in some killer clowns, some Sith Lords, and some superpowered beings, and we have a year chock full of villainous goodness or villainous badness, depending on what way you want to look at it. The nominees for the best villain of 2019 are Brandon from Brightburn, Arthur Fleck slash Joker from Joker, the Thromby family from Knives Out, the Kim family from Parasite, the Ladomus family from Ready or Not. And the fanny goes to the Kim family from Parasite. The Kims are really interesting, and I'm going to tell you, they almost didn't make my list of villains this year because they're not exactly villains most of the time. They're just desperate people who want money, not because they're greedy, but because they want to survive. They want to put food on the table, and they live in a crappy little basement apartment that probably stinks and is located in the middle of a slum, they're not doing well for themselves. As a person who myself lives in a basement apartment, I can relate. It would be nice to be able to afford to not live in a basement apartment. Then the Kims put a plan into action that is not necessarily evil, but is definitely illegal and sinister and backhanded, and you can't help but have fun while you're watching this plan unfold. And you think, hey, These guys are kind of con artists, but it's getting the job done. And they're not necessarily hurting anybody, but then, oh wait, they are hurting people. They are costing people their jobs. They are costing good people their jobs. And it's not a matter of taking what they feel they deserve. It becomes them taking from others who are just as unfortunate as themselves to feed themselves. It becomes an every man for himself situation and the Kims don't care who gets in their way, who they trample on their way to the top. Then the movie takes another turn, as Parasite has many of those turns, and all of a sudden, the Kim family's not looking so great anymore. Their antics aren't cute and hilarious. Now all of a sudden, you're just like, whoa, whoa, guys, You need to dial it back. You have taken this way too far. At the beginning of the movie, I was rooting for the Kims. By the halfway point of the movie, I was definitely not rooting for the Kims. And by the end of the movie, I wasn't sure if I should have been rooting for anybody at all. And that's the beauty of Parasite. And that's the beauty of the Kim family as a villainous unit. They really hit you in a place where they make you consider where you would draw the line. Are our lines that static? Are we that morally ambiguous? We can only hope the answer is no. But the Kims are, aside from, you know, some very clever, devious plots they come up with, they're a very realistic family. They're not over the top. They're everybody. They they can be any low-income family. And in a world where class distinction is becoming more and more prevalent, that's even scarier. So congratulations, Kim family. You all were the best villains of 2019. But we still got six days ahead of us in the Fanny Awards. Tomorrow, we're going to kick it up a notch. Bam! So stick around. Tomorrow is day four. I'll be talking about my number seven movie of the year. And I'll be giving out the award for the best action slash fight scene. Because if anybody knows about fighting, it's me, a guy who doesn't even know how to throw a punch. I'll see you tomorrow, Fanny fans. Don't go anywhere. Bam! Bam!